please welcome our first and not our last chief data scientist, DJ Patil. Good morning, my fellow scientists and science supporters. Now, this is what awesome looks like. If you have that sign, I want to see you raise it high and say science. science. Whoa, 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 whoa. That is not how science rolls, and you don't put down those signs yet. On the count of three, let's hear science. One, two, three. Now that is what I'm talking about. This is what it makes it so good to be back home. Thank you for coming out to be here to support science. Let's just start off by saying it's an interesting time we live in right now. There's this running question of what makes America great. So I want to talk to you today about what does make America great. And spoiler alert, it's science. But I want to do it through a few of the stories of the amazing Americans I've had a chance to work with and meet over the last few years when I was not only in the President Obama's White House, but when I was also in the Bush administration. And one of the most favorite things over the past two years was when we turned the White House into a science fair. We invited kids, absolutely, a science fair where the White House only spent a day talking about science. We invited kids from all around the country to show off their research. And wow, these projects that they did are the epitome of what makes America great. Take, for example, Nathan. Nathan, who is 15 at the time and built machine learning and AI algorithms to detect genetic mutations that are likely to cause cancer. Simon Peter, Maya, Grayson, who in their early teens designed a new prosthetic leg that will allow an amputee to hike, manage uneven terrain, or my favorite part, ride a skateboard. <laughs> Olivia, at 17, developed a rapid, portable, inexpensive diagnostic test for detecting the Ebola virus. These kids are from every walk of life, from every part of America. Spend five minutes with them, and you'll leave the conversation with an incredible inferiority complex. <laughs> it's not just those kids. Look around you right now. Look at all the boys and all the girls. You are our future scientists. You are the ones who will lead us to the stars. You are the ones who will understand the deep mysteries of physics, unlock the beauty of math, and discover the next medical breakthrough or invent the next type of new material. My friend, the former Secretary of Defense, Ash Carter, often reminds us security is like air. You know you only need it when you don't have it. The same is true about science. The basis of our country's national and economic security is science and technology. It has been true from the founding of this nation. This is the nation where both the Continental Congress and our first president, George Washington, created the Army Corps of Engineers. Their mission to provide vital public engineering services in peace and war to strengthen our nation's security, energize the economy, and reduce risk from disasters. This is the nation that enacted the National Aeronautics and Space Act, establishing NASA creating a path forward to win the space race to the moon, and today continues to lead our efforts to understand the Earth and the university universe above. This is the nation that established the National Institutes for Health, the NIH, to drive the next set of breakthroughs and making sure that we have the best medical care in the world that everyone needs to have access to. This is the nation that led the way in protecting our water and making sure we have clean air by establishing the Environmental Protection Agency. The EPA, who are you? The EPA, who members you're gonna hear from in just a minute, where more than half 
more than half of the EPA's employees are engineers, scientists, and environmental protection specialists. This is the nation that establishes colleges and universities that are the envy of the world. This is the nation that created the internet. But let's be clear, government didn't do this alone. It sparked the fire, but industry, academia, public-private partnerships nurtured the flames. Examples, GPS, the discovery of DNA and genetic sequencing, robotics, even data science. And we're seeing it happen right now, once again, with artificial intelligence, self-driving cars, and autonomous vehicles. But let me tell you this, we can't take this for granted. We'll only know that we've lost the lead when we don't have it. The investments and sacrifices that the generations before us made are the ones we are benefiting from today. That includes those that have come from all around the world as immigrants and refugees to make this nation stronger. In 2016, Nobel Prizes were given to six researchers and scientists at American universities. The common thread, all six were born outside the United States. 2 those of you out there who have dedicated your lives to science and innovation, thank you. To those who have served in our armed forces or in public service, you have my eternal gratitude. To those of you that teach, to those of you that teach, thank you for everything you have done and will continue to do no matter what. You are our secret ingredient. Our superpower has always been and will continue to be nurturing our best and brightest to work on the greatest challenges of the day. Science and engineering can't wait. Slowing down is not an option. Kids in Flint, Michigan still don't have clean water. The climate is changing. The next pandemic could be around the corner. We have a growing world population that needs to be fed and educated and our national defenses will continue to depend on innovation. And cancer and rare diseases continue to take far too many of the lives. It is one of the reasons that so much of my time at the White House as a data scientist, as a mathematician, was focused on finding the next generation of medical cures through the Precision Medicine Initiative and the Cancer Moonshot. I want to take a quick moment and tell you about one of those most amazing people I met, Jennifer Bittner who wrote into the president, President Obama, and yes, we did read the letters. At least back then we read the letters. <laughs> Can you believe that we have to do this stuff? <laughs> Here's the thing. Here's the first thing you need to know about Jennifer. She is a beautiful person. She's a wonderful husband, a wonderful wife to her husband, Rod, a phenomenal mother to their son, and a child on the way. She is a force of nature. And here's what Jennifer had to say in her own words. This is Jennifer. I was diagnosed with stage four metastatic breast cancer that had spread to my liver, lungs, adrenal glands, spleen, ovaries, spine, hips, ribs, femur, scapula, clavicle, and many other bones. One doctor said I'd be in hospice within three months. While it's hard to put into words how grateful I am to have had every single moment of this wonderful life the past few years, it's certainly not easy. I've been on chemotherapy or other treatments every single day. I've endured multiple surgeries and radiation, as well as anxiety of weeks of tumor markers and scans every three months. My treatment side effects are challenging, at times debilitating. Despite all of this, the average life expectancy for someone with metastatic brain cancer is just three short years. Three short years is far too, she goes along to say, three four years is far too short when you're not even halfway through life. Research is absolutely critical to extending and improving the lives of people with cancer, especially now that we're on the precipice of some incredible medical breakthroughs such as immunotherapies. That's why it's so critical that research be fully funded. We are so close, but most of us can't wait much longer. Here's the thing, here's the thing. If we don't go faster, 
Jennifer doesn't get to see her kids learn how to ride a bike. Her kids learn how to read. Her kids learn how to be in a class play. Her kids will be robbed of a chance to have a mother. Talk to any of the scientists who are out there. All of you scientists are out there. You know as well as I do that Jennifer's right. We can go faster. What's it take? We all know. Funding. Investment in science. Pressure to do the right thing. Talk to anything, any patient. They'll say the same thing as Jennifer or as any scientist. We must go fancier. Cancer doesn't wait. Rare diseases don't wait. Pandemics don't wait. Our kids can't wait. Finding cures require, requires investment in all the sciences, math, biology, physics, chemistry, material sciences, computer science, sociology, psychology, ecology, and even data science. We owe it all to all the Jennifer Bittners out there because one of those Jennifers could be one of our loved ones. When it comes to our nation, when we focus as a community, when we are all relentless in our determination to support all the sciences, we will ensure that science is in its rightful place, leading this great nation forward. Forward for a positive future for my children, your children, the world's children, and our children's children. Science can't wait. Let's get to work. Thank you. Live long and prosper.